Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests and distinguished speakers. I'm Terence, your MC today. Today's webinar is organized by KEEP of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to today's event, where we will explore the challenges of ChatGPT in education. As we all know, ChatGPT is a powerful AI tool that can revolutionize the way we teach and we learn. But with great power comes great responsibility. We must be mindful of the potential challenges and pitfalls that comes with it. Before we commence the webinar, I would like to invite you to take a moment to participate in a poll on Zoom regarding ChatGPT and its use in education. Your valuable feedback will enrich our discussion and help us better understand the issues at hand. Our webinar today comprises three parts, a sharing session, a panel discussion, and a Q&A session. We hope that these discussions will provide valuable insights into the challenges of using ChatGPT in education and enable us to adopt a more responsible and effective approach to integrating AI tools in education. Our panel list today comes from diverse backgrounds and disciplines, and they will share their perspectives on the topic. Moderating today's panel discussion is Professor Erwin Kang from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is the chair and professor of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at CUHK as well as the director of ELITE and PI of KIP. Professor Kang has led several projects involving AI, and his research in interests include AI, machine learning, social computing, and data mining. Now, I would like to invite Professor Kang to introduce and welcome today's panelists. Thank you, Terence. Uh, it is uh, my great honor, and uh, I'm really excited about today's uh, event uh, to introduce uh, our panelists for today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce to you is Professor Herman Kaplan. Uh, Professor Kaplan uh, received his PhD in philosophy from UC Berkeley. And I just would like to say, in fact, today's theme, we like to have a very diverse uh, views on this uh, particular issue. So we have philosophers, we have people in technology, and with people in education and so on, so on, communications, to talk about this uh, this uh, event. And uh, coming back to this, uh, Professor Kaplan is a director of AI and Humanity Labs at uh, Hong Kong U. Uh, his research focus is on the philosophy of AI, conceptual engineering, the conceptual foundation of political discourse, and more. And he re uh, recently, he has published uh, Making AI Intelligible. Um, uh, so uh, we welcome Professor Kaplan. Next is Professor Eric Choi from the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering, Hong Kong Polytech University. And uh, he received his uh, degree from Deakin University uh, in AI and knowledge engineering. So, you know, he would know all the technical background uh, of uh, AI and chat GPT. Uh, he's associate director uh, of the knowledge management and Innovation Research Center. And his research focus is on knowledge management technologies, knowledge services, semantic technologies, and blended learning systems. You could also see his uh, recent awards on the screen. Our next panelist, uh, Sean McMean, is the, uh, com comes from um, Enhanced learning. Uh, his research 
focus is on educational technology, digital, digital literacies, and network learning. And you can see that he also won a Teaching Innovation Award for this work. Uh, last but not least, our panelist is Dr. Florin Constantine Serban from uh, the Department of Communication Studies, Hong Kong Baptist University. He received his uh, degree in communications from the Hong Kong Baptist University. And his research focus includes artificial intelligence and its impact on professional identities, media sociology, and public participation. And uh, so before he joined Baptist, he was act, uh, actually a postgrad, uh, a taught undergrad and postgrad courses at the University of Hong Kong and City University of Hong Kong. So we welcome these four panelists uh, for today. So I'm turning back to uh, Terence now. So I'm confident that our esteemed speakers will provide us with valuable insights into this crucial topic. So let's begin our webinar with the sharing session by inviting Professor Herman Kaplan from the University of Hong Kong to share his perspective on the challenges of using ChatGPT in education. Professor Kaplan, the stage is yours. So I will quit my screen, quit my slide first. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for organizing this. Can you hear me? Is everything yep. good? Yes, okay. everybody. Right. I'm gonna focus on three claims. I'll summarize them at the end and let's just go through them along the way, but they have a kind of common theme, which is this is amazing and incredibly interesting technology, but it's not really massively transformative. We shouldn't worry too much. Okay. First claim, ChatGPT is less transformative than the internet. Not that long ago, some of us will remember the time before this, uh, somewhere around the mid 1980s, the internet, which didn't exist before that, made literature, lectures, any kind of help on any conceivable topic accessible to students at a click. And intellectual work was then changed forever. But nonetheless, even though it was changed, if you went, someone took someone in a little time machine from a classroom in 1925 or 1850 into a classroom today, they would recognize the basic structure of what we're doing. There wasn't a complete transformation in the kind of activity that we engage in. And I see chat GPT and similar systems as a continuation of what was started in the 80s and 90s. It's not more transformative on education than what we've already been through. So we've been through a massively transformative period but this is a continuation of that, not a radical break. So if you keep that in mind, you will sort of avoid a little bit of the overhype that I think we sometimes see. I should add, I do think it, of course, will have some effect on the job areas that we focus on. So there's a, just a working paper that just came out from OpenAI and Open Research saying that they think, for example, interpreters, writers and authors, public relations specialists, mathematicians, tax preparers, their job prospects will go radically down. And as a result, of course, we will somewhat change or, or course offerings. Then again, that's somewhat continues. We've been changing our offerings at educational institutions uh, when faced with changed job markets. So continuity. Second thing I want to talk about, which uh, in my setting as a university professor, there's a lot of talk about, which is cheating and how we can assign work to students in a way that makes as confident that they actually have the knowledge and are not just copying something. And I think here again, nothing completely revolutionary is happening. Uh, keep in mind, before ChatGPT, before any of these AI systems, students were literally a minute away from just paying for a paper, an essay reply online. They could do that. They had literally an infinite number of strategies for cheating that the internet had given them. Uh, chat GPT, I think of it as like having a super smart and willing sibling or friend around that's willing to help you all the time. 
And as we did in the past, we just need to ensure that we have proofs of personal skill, if you will. The way we do that, I'm sure other panelists will talk more about this, but just briefly, I think we trust our students. That's number one. We test in person, both verbally and written. We assign essays that focus on in-class discussion and maybe require reference to group internal documents because those things are not accessible uh, to something like ChatGPT. And then we use various kinds of technological solutions like watermarking, if that's going to work. Uh, but overall, I think the picture should be encourage students to use AI as long as it's not cheating and use familiar strategies for combating that cheating. I mean, I did all my university work writing papers in a setting where I had no access to technology at all. We, that's not a radical new thing. That's just going back to something we're familiar with. So it's not, not a very big change. I want to focus on this last point. Um, and this is what I think isn't being made sufficiently salient in the current discussion of these issues. And it's this. So in my view, and this is my writing about these issues, I, I endorse the view that AIs such as ChatGPT can be rational, intelligent, linguistically competent, unimaginably smart. They even have emotions and intentions. Very controversial views. But even someone like me who, who goes all the way out like they think, I can then see that there is a temptation. Okay. And the temptation is to treat AIs as a guru, as a guide for how to live your life and ultimately how to organize societies and make collective decisions. And I think a core job for us as educators is to explain why that attitude is absurd, impossible, confused, and dangerous. And this is because most of the questions we really care about are assessive and essentially contestable, and they cannot be answered by AIs. What do I mean by that? Here's a bunch of questions, and these are just a small selection, literally an infinite number of questions like this. How should large cities balance interests of pedestrians versus cars? What is a fair tax system? Should you be a vegetarian? Which profession will make you happiest? Should Hong Kong build a northern metropolis, long-time artificial islands, both or neither? These and almost all other important questions don't have conclusive answers. So no AI system can tell you the answer. To answer these questions, you have to balance competing considerations, values, and norms against each other. And so I think our job is to teach students uh, that the burden of thinking cannot be offloaded to anyone and definitely not to an AI. Or education should constantly emphasize such points of contradiction, disagreement, and incompatibility in values and norms. And our core mission is now even more critical because it will be easier for students and of course for us to be lazy and intellectually irresponsible. Now, this is my final slide. Um, this way of thinking about the core mission of education goes all the way back to the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm. And there's this great passage uh, from an essay he wrote called What is Enlightenment? And Kant said, this is from 1784, okay? Uh, Kant says, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. And think of another here as being something like ChatGPT. This immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from another. Have courage to use your own understanding. That is the motto of the Enlightenment. And I think our job as educators is to continue these projects that trace back to the Enlightenment. Our job is to make sure our students' minds don't become slaves of AI. And there's a continuing tradition from the Kantian perspective. So for example, Dewey adds a social dimension, not just think for yourself, but think with others. So for, for Dewey, the goal of education was doing projects together, learn how to create common goals, think together. You can't do that, but that's not something ChatGPT can do for you. You need other people. Okay, so in summary form, ChatGPT is not more transformative than the invention of the internet. So don't be more freaked out than you were in the 80s or 90s. Claim two, ChatGPT makes cheating a bit easier, but the solutions are familiar. Finally, ChatGPT makes our core educational mission more salient 
teach students to think for themselves and jointly about questions that don't have unique answers that involve competing norms, values, and considerations. Thank you. And I will so, stop sharing. Thank you, Professor Captain, for your enlightening presentation. Now, let me welcome Professor Eric Choi from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University to share his insights with us. Thank you, uh, uh, Terence, and uh, thank you, Professor Kaplan, uh, very enlightening uh, uh, sharing. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, I draw an analogy with uh, what you just said. Uh, you know, I'm an old man, and uh, I recall that, uh, in fact, in the 1960s, uh, we were banned from, uh, you know, taking calculators into classroom and examinations. And now, to, you know, as you can see from this diagram, to 2023, uh, some universities have banned the use of uh, AI tools uh, in uh, assessments and examinations. So, uh, you know, in a way, it's, it's not, uh, not that new at all. History is repeating itself. But uh, <laughs> I, I will try to amplify some of the things that you have said and uh, take it to the uh, operational level, at least at the planning level. And I see that there are four major challenges ahead of uh, all of us, as, uh, especially as uh, educationalists. And they are firstly, um, you know, to, which is the first one I think is among the four most uh, ignored at the moment. You know, to, I believe uh, everybody needs to be more, uh, you know, to, uh, cognizant about uh, the generative AI tools, not just relying on it as a, as a black box, as I see many people are just, uh, you know, treating it uh, in, in that way. And secondly, you know, to, obviously as educationalists, uh, as you said, uh, we should embrace it and we should uh, work with students, learn with, together with students on how to best embrace them, okay? And that, again, goes back to understanding more about the different types of tools, what it can do, scope and limitations. I'll come back to that uh, a, a fraction later. And thirdly, you know, to, uh, where many of my colleagues are busy, uh, you know, they're working on right now is to uh, try to redesign assessments, you know, to, to measure and, uh, you know, to uh, uh, engage our students' ability from different ways and angles uh, than uh, before. And I have an example to, uh, to show everybody. Uh, I'm not a, uh, a legal person, uh, but uh, I paid uh, full respect to uh, the legal issues, compliance, protection of privacy, confidentiality, uh, especially privacy of, uh, of students. So, uh, you know, the, in the, uh, stepping forward, I think university also need to come up with uh, very strict uh, guidelines, uh, improve the guidelines and uh, 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 rules as well as policies on specifying what can be used, how to use them, and uh, what should be disclosed in a proper way. Well, to, uh, as uh, Professor King, uh, you know, was chatting to us uh, before the start, uh, wow, you know, uh, we just can't keep up with the pace of the, the proliferation uh, and the complexity of these tools. Uh, you know, to, in a week, there's another 2,000 to 3,000 uh, new tools on the market, so uh, it's really difficult. Uh, but uh, do the best I can, you know, in the last uh, few months, I've been uh, trying to, um, you know, give them certain categories. And I believe, you know, as we uh, look down the list, uh, the first one is probably most people are focusing on right now. Most people are uh, very uh, immersive in it. You're trying to get the benefits and try to ascertain how the best position to uh, reap the benefits from that. That's text generation. That's a summarization of text, question answering, uh, you know, to, uh, knowledge extraction, concept extraction, from a huge repository, a corpus, uh, documents, uh, as well as uh, asking uh, the software to, uh, you know, to, to, to present certain materials in certain formats and even to a specific uh, audience at a particular level. And then there is, uh, you know, the image and video generations, uh, which I'm still uh, playing around with, you know, I'm no expert in this, but, uh, you know, it does provide some, uh, uh, you know, some wow effects uh, occasionally. Uh, and uh, we are all waiting for, uh, you know, the testing and the operation of uh, Copilot from Microsoft, and that's, uh, you know, giving us uh, slide generation and other types of automation within the Microsoft Office suite. And people who are working with uh, computer science uh, and information systems definitely are full bottle on uh, testing out uh, uh, AI tools on code generation, code checking, and uh, execution. And there's a lot more. And there's another silent message on this line that is, if you uh, look at, uh, you know, the, 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 the lower half of the bullet points, I sense that there's a, you know, it's a flavor of creativity coming through, you know, to, uh, computer creativity. And by that, you know, to, that already give me the, uh, the convincing signal that we should be embracing these tools, right? Because uh, human is very creative, but you know, guess what? Combining human and, uh, and computers uh, ability, we can easily amplify or expect to 
are easily amplified and multiplied at the uh, the extent and the quality of the uh, of the uh, innovations and creativity and we should be mm-hmm. uh, embracing that even just for this reason uh again um, you know the more focused you know so what are the uh, one of the understanding that I was stressing about uh, learning more about these tools, which I don't think uh, everyone is doing enough. Now I understand that not everyone is a computer scientist, but having said that, we should still, even for those of us who are not computer scientists, uh, should not be treating web uh, uh, chat box, uh, chat uh, GPT as a kind of a black box, right? Because uh, we should pay more attention up to the level that we can understand, up to the level of conceptualization and abstraction that we can understand. What are you know generative AI? What is the general you know power, uh, strength, and weaknesses of these kind of uh, of tools? What is the large language model? What does that mean? You know, it's, uh, what is the power of this model? What is reinforcing learning from human preferences? With that, how do we actually uh, you know uh, make use of uh, feedback keywords and providing structure so that uh, we can help? cooperatively working with the software to narrow closer and closer to what we really want, okay, whatever that is. And very importantly, data, you know, uh, these are training data. What are they, um, you know, where are they from? Uh, How are they being uh, used for for training up to what period? I don't, I know, you know, I've been following up with the literature. I know that, uh, you know, the chat GPT's uh, uh, data, it's uh, trained up to uh, later 2021. And now with a new plugin, Theoretically, they can also, the software can also access, uh, you know, the internet uh, data, which is up to date. But then, you know, there must be a distinction between the data being used for trained uh, model versus the data you access or the access on the internet instantly. So uh, that understanding that more will give us more insight uh, into our own critical thinking to ascertain, you know, the truthfulness, the accuracy, and how to uh, exploit the strength and avoid the weaknesses of these two. As Professor King also said before the uh, the start of the seminar, you know, 80% of the time the information seems to be correct. So what about that 20%? Well, uh, I think that with, that, with, with knowing a bit more knowledge about uh, what I've said in the previous slides, uh, perhaps that 20% can be reduced to 10 or 10 or 10% or even less. So, you know, so I've seen uh, colleagues, uh, students uh, using these kind of tools to extract, analyze, summarize information from large repository of uh, of data. They use that to generate a script, maybe the initial version of a script or a template for uh, presentations uh, and for, uh, you know, uh, document uh, uh, deliverables. And academics uh, also uh, can generate, uh, using this kind of software to generate, for example, you know, it's a course outlined, and of course, we have to run our eyes over it. We have to apply our professional judgment to continue to uh, improve it, correct it, either by ourselves or cooperatively with the two. But uh, there are challenges, and as I said, uh, you know, challenges about how to specify the context, uh, the structure, providing feedback, because we are dealing with generative AI tools. They need these kind of things to to feed them so that they can improve on the accuracy and the uh, you know, uh, and the quality of the output. And by that, we also need to know about the data that they're operating on uh, as compared to the question that we are asking, as well as the level of reasoning that is expected. All right, so, uh, you know, not to take up that any more time, uh, I've been uh, trying to uh, testing the redesign of uh, assignments uh, mm. so that, uh, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, we still want to measure or know about our students' uh, critical thinking skills, logic, reasoning, uh, problem solving skills and language comprehension skills. I mean, that's that's no escape anyway, in respect to which discipline. So, you know, it's, uh, I'm thinking about uh, maybe we can split, you know, it's, uh, previously, for example, if you ask students to submit an essay, we mark them based on the final del- deliverable. How about now we expand that into four deliverables? One is, you know, a plan of action. So students submit their plan of action. Now the teacher can give feedback and teacher can uh, give uh, feedback several times, you know, maybe uh, over a few weeks during the semester. And by that, uh, we get to understand more about what the students, uh, you know, problem solving and creative thinking skills, ability to decompose a complex problem into subparts and tackle it. And then uh, they will have to submit a lot of the uh, generative AI tools that they have used and uh, the responses on the questions they have asked. Uh, during those uh, sessions. Uh, they submit the final deliverable so that uh, the teacher can also compare, you know, and contrast about uh, uh, how much of that uh, of that uh, final deliverable is traceable or identical to what is directly being produced by the tool, uh, as well as, of course, those parts that were discarded by 
the student, but indeed the student may have improved on the, the inadequacies or shortfall of the tool and come up with a better piece. And finally, I think this is very important, especially if you are taking the, uh, the cognitism view of, uh, of uh, learning theory, and that is uh, you know, asking the student to reflect deep reflection about what you have learned, what you think about the tool, what are the areas that you think the tool are doing well, and why is it doing well, what are the areas that you think the tool needs improvement, and why is that, and how would you do it again, you know, if you have a, a second chance, or maybe in the future, when the data is uh, even more richer. So I finished here, you know, I think we are on at the beginning of uh, entering a human machine uh, com cooperative freeway, it's exciting, uh, you know, it's, uh, we, uh, these kind of, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, finishing touches and also frictions, tensions we would have to uh, work through before we get to our smart future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor Choi, for your insightful presentation. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Sean McMean from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology to share his knowledge and expertise on this topic. All right, thank you. Um, I enjoy listening to the first two speakers, and I think there's a lot of overlap with what you said and what, what I'm about to say. Uh, in particular, I, I agree that um, this may not be as disruptive as the hype is leading it up to be, but it is continu continuation. Uh, and, and I really like the point that you said that uh, it's not a guru, that is absurd, uh, uh, but we have to think about how we interact with it and uh, it's, it's part of a complex system which I'll talk about in my talk and I also agree with Eric that uh, the, the four items that you uh, mentioned particularly how can we leverage AI tools and redesign assessments that's an important part so my my section I'm going to divide my uh, session into three distinct parts but they're all leading up to uh, my main argument why we need to uh, think about AI literacy and embed it into curricula uh, within higher education, but even in, in secondary school as well. And uh, I'll begin with the first part. Oops. And um, I'm going to begin with pre-GPT, right? Mm -hmm. Pre-GPT-3. Uh, a lot of organizations and well-known uh, players have been talking about for some time the importance of preparing students for the future of work. And usually uh, three main categories that you hear are we need to develop te technological skills, social skills, and higher cognitive skills. And this ranges from critical thinking and creativity to communication collaboration, but also data analysis. And three key players in this is OECD, uh, World Economic Forum, and UNESCO. Um, if we Look at another uh, player, uh, McKinsey, well, the McKinsey Global Institute at the World Economic Forum. Uh, I have identified 56 distinct elements of talent, and they've categorized them into four different areas cognitive, interpersonal, digital, and self leadership. So this is pre chat GPT. Um, now, post chat GPT, I, I would argue all of these skills are still important, but some of them are becoming increasingly important. Um, while it might not be as disruptive as the uh, as popular media might make us believe, it will be disruptive. For example, Goldman Sachs just came up with a report uh, indicating all of the job industries that will be highly impacted uh, by uh, GPT or generative AI. Lawyers, for example, would be one of the most highest impacted uh, uh, professions as a result of generative AI. So we need to start thinking, well, Logical reasoning is going to become increasingly important. Understanding biases uh, because of the inherent bias that can go into uh, the, the data sets and the training and also uh, AI generated bias as well. So how do we prepare students for this working world? And also adaptability. In fact, this report says that adaptability is the strongest delta to increase employment employability. And just think back to pre-COVID. Uh, uh, since COVID has happened and now with generative AI, uh, we have had to be highly adaptable in how we approach work. So these skill sets are increasing in importance. Okay. More recently, I think uh, this is already mentioned, uh, reports are starting to come out to talk about how uh, generative AI is going to impact the child market. And unsurprisingly, I think um, uh, their, their finding or initial findings are areas such as science and critical thinking will have less impact or be less impacted by the current forms of GPTs. 
uh, and uh, professions that require programming and writing skills will be strongly influenced by GPTs. So my second part is we now we need to think about, we're thinking about the future of work and the skill sets that are needed, both pre and post GPT, but we also need to think, well, who, who is driving the development of generative AIs? Who is behind the, uh, the design, the gatekeeping, the content policy making, and uh, the design of all of these? Well, at the moment, it's mostly the commercial world. And we're relying on the commercial world to uh, be the gatekeepers, uh, to make sure that, that these tools are being used for in an ethical way. Uh, and if we go back, this is old data now, I know, but it's, it's, I don't think it's changed all that much. Uh, if we look at venture capitalists and who's investing into uh, generative AI landscape, the majority of it comes from North America with uh, China and, and Southeast Asia and Australia uh, fast, uh, fastly growing. And areas that they're concerned about are the rising pseudo imagination that's uh, generative AI basically text to uh, uh, speech or text to image type of uh, programs, but also medical care looking at it and uh, ways of avoiding or catching banking fraud. So these are the driving areas uh, that are uh, venture capitalists are interested in. So this leads me to my my third point, and that's of emerging properties and complex systems. So if we think of complex systems, complex systems are systems that have many parts that affect each other and the whole system in different ways. It could be multiple players, multiple agents within uh, a complex system, a social complex, complex system. Education is a social complex system. So for instance, um, changing teaching methods or uh, incorporating ChatGPT or Bing Chat uh, into a lesson or an assessment can have unexpected results in student performance and engagement. So we need to start thinking about the emergent properties within the social complex systems now that uh, ChatGPT can theoretically be considered as an agent uh, in this system, working on multiple levels. And uh, knowing this, then we need to think about, well, I'm coming back to my earlier point, who designed the, the, the technology that we're using, what culture was embedded in its planning and its production and its design in, in its implementation in its policy making or, or how it's being run, the policies to guide it, right? Culture will be embedded into all of this. So that has an impact and it can be a variable within a social complex system. So that leads us to a number of questions we can ask ourselves. Uh, how does generative AI reveal the world to us if we use it, if we rely on it? What kind of culture does it embed and promote? How does it affect our relationship with nature and other human beings? How does it shape our, our understanding of ourselves and our role in the world? And how does it challenge or support our values and goals? These are just random questions I, I thought about. I'm, there, there could be many more uh, on this topic. Um, and of course, there's also disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation uh, that we need to think about, uh, unintentional or intentional. Uh, and uh, this, the rise of uh, chat GPT or generative AI can potentially be used in that. Just to give you a real world case, uh, there's a case of a, a reporter who got into a little bit of trouble because he used, I can't remember which one, it was Mid Journey, I believe, version five, uh, to promote an uh, image of uh, Donald Trump being arrested. And it looked very, very real, right? I mean, if you look closely, you can tell it's generated. But if you just look at it quickly, it looks incredibly real. Now, as a result of that, Mid Journey now has banned the word in prompts, the word arrested. So if you try to do an image and you use the word arrested, it will tell you you're not allowed to use that word. So that's going back again now to my earlier point. Who are the gatekeepers and who's making these decisions? I mean, to ban the word arrested in a prompt seems a bit over the top to me, All right? So we need to think then uh, with how data sets are being trained or how the, the, the AI generative tools are being trained, even creators and trainers of AI uh, will not even know where they're incorrect. So there might be unintentional 
uh, spreading of bad ideas or distorting reality uh, if you rely too much on AI. And I think the points that were raised earlier are valid. We can't rely too much on AI, right? Um, a little bit more closer to home here in Hong Kong, uh, let's take a look at the anti-discrimination laws, which were designed uh, to uh, apply to discriminatory behavior to natural or legal persons. They do not address the new forms of discrimination that may arise from technological development. For example, leaving room for established biases and data to be amplified in the use of artificial intelligence. So this is something that we need to, to, to be very careful about. So we have bias built into data. We have AI-induced bias as well. Coming to, which has already been mentioned by the two previous talkers, we, uh, there's now a call, Elon Musk and another uh, well-known people are calling for a pause in uh, giant AI experiments in open letter. And they raise some questions uh, somewhat similar to what we're talking about already today. Uh, should we let machines flood our information channels with propaganda and untruth, for example? Uh, whether or not this is possible to pause it, uh, whether or not it's the right thing, I think that's open for debate. Uh, but I do think, and I do agree uh, with uh, first panelist Herman in the sense that we need to take a step back and just understand that this might not be as transformative as we think it is, but we do still need to be mindful. So all of this is really my rationale, those three points to, to argue why AI literacy is important and why we should be introducing it into the curriculum, whether at a high school level or higher education or both. Uh, AI literacy is increasingly becoming important for our future of work so that we understand what will be expected once we graduate, uh, but also to help us understand the biases that are inherent or possibly embedded into the design of the technologies and so on. So I'll leave it there uh, with that. And um, thank you. Thank you, Sean, for your informative presentation. Finally, we are honored to welcome Dr. Florent Constantin Serban from Hong Kong Baptist University to present his insights with us. Florent, please head the stage. Hi, uh, thank you so much for uh, the previous speakers. I uh, uh, had a great time uh, listening to all of you. I come from the field of communication, right? And uh, I will be combining today's talk into two parts. First of all, what does it mean for the communication process, uh, all these development of AI generative tools? And second of all, I will give you some examples of what I've been doing this uh, uh, semester and how I have employed uh, some AI tools into my uh, uh, classes. First of all, if we go into the field of communication, there has always been uh, uh, technology involved, right? So I totally agree with the previous speakers. We are seeing a continuation of a big wave and when that wave will crash, we don't know, but it's not something completely new, right? Because being in communication, we cannot talk about it, whether we are talking about hieroglyphs and uh, later on we go into uh, scribes and uh, later on we have the printing press, right? And fast, fast forward to uh, our days today, we can talk about advertisements in the metaverse or, you know, uh, chat GPT coming and transforming our uh, current communication uh, uh, jobs, right? So all the time throughout the development of uh, uh, communication, we have seen this uh, debate about technologies. And right now, I am personally fascinated about uh, uh, these um, uh, AI developments, but at the same time, I would like to contextualize them. I would like to see them as being part of a larger picture and not being necessarily as transformative as some people believe to be. Uh, if we are moving uh, the conversation towards things that are uh, you know, uh, immediately next to us, what should we do with the AI tools? And to, so, to, to what extent should we come to students and say, don't go there, right? Because if you are using these tools in a certain way, you are going to get into plagiarism, right? Uh, uh, do not over rely on these kind of tools. Where do we actually draw the line? Because in our work in the field of communication, we have relied on these kind of generative uh, uh, technologies for a very long time, right? If I go back into the publishing world in the 80s, we already have software that is helping us, the creators, to come up with uh, a new content, right? And today, for example, if I use software, uh, such as uh, Adobe XD, 
in 10 hours of content of contact, I can generate um, uh, mobile apps with students that are drawing from large libraries, right? So at the end of the day, because students are using uh, content management systems, CMS, they do not create things from scratch. They are using what is already available out there and they are putting something together. So where do I draw the line? And I say, what you are doing here is plagiarism. What you are, do I, what you are doing here is wrong, right? Because obviously using such software in order to create mobile apps will not be seen as plagiarism. And going one step further, I'm sure some of, you, some of you might remember Clippy, right? Who was helping us in Microsoft Word in order to uh, make our, our job easier and faster, not necessarily better, right? Uh, today, we are using something like Grammarly, which is also AI uh, um, uh, driven, All right? So my question would be, if we desire students, if we want students to give us papers that are written correctly, perhaps ran through software like uh, uh, Grammarly, then where, why do we come and we ban these technologies from classes and we come and draw a line and tell students that you are not allowed to do this or that? So that's where I am with my uh, uh, questions. Personally, I have employed um, uh, uh, these kind of generative AI tools in two of my classes. The first one, very basic, I am teaching an interviewing class where students go from everything from uh, journalistic interviews uh, to focus groups, to employment interviews. And basically they were able uh, uh, to input questions to the chat GPT and see how based on whether they have open-ended or closed-ended questions, they will trigger different kinds of responses. Now, obviously they could have done this in pair as well, right? Uh, match two students and they can interview one another, but normally they will uh, prepare their answers in advance. So uh, definitely, uh, using these kind of um, uh, technologies in the classroom has uh, allowed us to be more authentic, if you want, has allowed us to have uh, more um, uh, uh, interactions. Then for a focus group uh, uh, assignment, students had to refine their topic uh, by soliciting input from uh, ChatGPT. Now, I would like to say that these kind of technologies are very good at the initial part of the process. When students don't know very well what they have to do, where they have to go, uh, using ChatGPT for generating ideas, for example, might be very useful to them. What happens afterwards, it's not necessarily clear. Obviously, their cognition and their reasoning will come into play. But for the first part, when they have a blank piece of paper, I have found these kind of uh, uh, tools quite uh, effective. And the last thing, the elephant in the room, Let's not go back to the previous days, right? I was a student when um, uh, Wikipedia was becoming a thing and our instructors always told us, don't use Wikipedia, right? In the hope that we will go to the library. Well, we went on Google, we went on the search engines and we still got uh, uh, information that was probably even poorer than what we were finding on um, uh, uh, Wikipedia. So my idea would be not to go back to this, uh, to this kind of days. Then I have also used MidJourney and ChatGPT for another class in media design, creating newsletters, creating websites, creating mobile apps. Uh, and uh, uh, the visual content was generated by students with the help of these uh, uh, apps. It's not great, but imagine that if students wouldn't be using uh, this MidJourney prompt in order to generate an illustration, they would just go on Google, find an image, download it, cited, properly cited, that, uh, that still doesn't change, but at the end of the day, their experience wouldn't have been as uh, excited. Yeah, so as I mentioned, for the written part, I have found uh, in my uh, classroom experiences that ChatGPT was very useful to develop initial ideas, but of course, otherwise, uh, the main uh, work come uh, uh, from their own. It was also very useful for the final part of the assignments when students had a headline, but obviously that was not probably the best uh, tool, the best fit, so they would go forward uh, and uh, uh, generate uh, a new one. I'm going to close in a second. Key takeaways. Um, students so far have been enjoying exploring this kind of uh, uh, generative uh, uh, AI tools. I think they are better to uh, uh, learn about them under guidance and uh, uh, looking precisely at the input they are giving uh, under our uh, uh, supervision or guidance, however you want to put it. And at the same time, we shouldn't have a moral panic 
students still have to do uh, the heavy part of uh, uh, the work. They need to come up with their cognition, with their reasoning, and to create to create the uh, uh, bulk uh, of their work. On the long term, I believe that these uh, AI tools can be grasped and they can be integrated into the uh, students' learning, at least in the short time, because we don't know how the future will um, uh, develop. We don't know what will happen uh, next. But we cannot go back to the good old days when you know uh, technology was banned. Uh, uh, Professor Choi uh, talked about the calculator being used in a classroom, right? We are going to have them. We are going to have Excel and all the kind of formulas we will not be able to strip technology back. If I have a concern, that will have to do with the uh, very difficult to grasp uh, concept of creativity, because uh, when students can go into these generative AI tools and they can provide any kind of prompt and get photos, videos, even music, right, from these um, uh, platforms, uh, I am concerned about their motivation to create new content. Nevertheless, I would say this is more uh, a structural issue and not necessarily something that is uh, primarily driven by the technology, but probably it is facilitated by the technology. I will stop here and I'm uh, happy to discuss with all of you further. Thank you. Thank you, Forum, for sharing your insights with us. Now, we will move to the panel discussion where the moderator, Professor Kim, will ask the speakers a few questions related to the topic. The speakers will provide brief answers, sharing their thoughts based on their knowledge, expertise, or experience. So now, let's pass the time to Professor Kim. Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, you know, one of the things I could uh, Get and uh, from all the talk is that perhaps we all become better prompt engineers, so we could ask the right question to get the right <laughs> to get the right result. Um, but anyway, let's come back to uh, uh, to our uh, uh, discussion session. Um, can you maybe? Uh, I know our time is limited, so. I'm not going to ask you paradigm shift because you talk mostly about this already, but maybe let's go to question number two, Terence. I'd like to ask all of you, just give a, a brief word uh, here, is what role should ethic and social responsibility play in developing and deploying chat GPT and other AI-powered generative tools for education? And how can educators ensure that they are using these technologies in line with their values and principles. I think that you mentioned it, but I just thought that let's 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 come back and summarize this. Um, uh, maybe uh, on my screen, I think Eric, you're you're the first one. Are you will you be able to say something? Well, it's, uh, I would say that uh, I can add to the framework that I presented and ask students to pay particular attention when they are developing their um, deliverables about the ethical and uh, social issues they involve, involved in the data, involved in the process of using these things. And they should also reflect upon uh, what they believe, uh, you know, to what they're doing is, uh, is indeed correct or not, as well as, uh, you know, find rooms for improvement. Because I think they need to develop that matter cognition, cognition and be conscious about, uh, you know, whatever the tool's uh, ability and performance is, but they should, uh, you know, to, Maybe uh, be maintaining their integrity and know uh, where the line draws with regard to uh, these kind of uh, very important uh, social issues. Okay. What about Sean? What, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with Eric uh, uh, about the framework that he mentions and, and uh, having students do that. And I think it's important. I, I think part of the social responsibility also falls on uh, the institutions and the professors and the faculty members, right? Uh, for one reason, not all faculty members have a deep understanding or even a, 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 an amateur understanding of how GPT works, right? And sometimes their mindset might be to stick their head in the sands. And, and that's not meant as a criticism. Everyone reacts in different ways to new technological development. 
right? And I think what we need to do is make sure somehow that all faculty members are trained at least in the very basics of what generative AI is and what it mm -hmm. can do, right? So when I talk about AI literacy, it's not just for students, it's also for teachers and faculty members. Uh, because if you start using it uh, irresponsibly in the classroom, that could have detrimental effects on the learning outcomes. Uh, if mm -hmm. it starts leading your pedagogy as opposed to the curriculum and the content and the, and the pedagogy, being at the forefront, uh, then you run into problems. And I can think of the, when Cahoots, for example, was introduced, I saw multiple uh, faculty members using Cahoots in the classroom, uh, but it had no real pedagogical implications. It was just there because of a novelty factor, right? So I think as teachers and, and administrators, we have a social responsibility to teach AI literacy uh, to ensure that it has responsible use in the classroom. Good. Yeah. Uh, Florian? Yes, thank you. I, I would like to, to follow up on uh, what uh, Sean just said. I think, yeah, we need to discuss a bit more about our social responsibility, right? Because I feel that uh, sometimes we are dodging um, uh, the uh, uh, introduction of these kind of tools, basically because they just, uh, uh, you know, uh, add quite a lot to our work and uh, uh, that makes our lives a bit more complicated. But um, mm -hmm. Let's be honest. I think it's absolutely fine to admit that in the first uh, uh, part of our um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, these AI tools, we are going to play with them. And I use the word very specifically. We don't know exactly where we'll, it will take us, right? We don't know exactly all the ins and outs and all the limitations that these AI tools have. But instead of just waiting for a moment when we can figure it out, right, and probably then we will have uh, chat gpt5 or 6 uh, we should start right away uh, uh, play with them see how our um, uh, uh, understanding of the topics we are teaching is improving and is changing and then trying to pass on this knowledge uh, to the students i wouldn't put all the pressures on them in the very beginning and saying you have a responsibility you're not allowed to do that because their uh, uh, usage of these tools will be very much limited thank you Herman. Herman, your thoughts? Yeah, I guess I, I'm thinking just back to something I said in, in my presentation. Suppose, yep. or I guess we did say this at the beginning when, when the internet became this integral part of our lives and we were asking, well, what kind of social and ethical responsibilities do we have with respect to use of the internet? Those are just such huge questions. And we now sort of know the answer to that. There are a lot of bad people in the world. There's a lot of good people. There are a bunch of in-between people. And we're going to use it for all kinds of horrible and wonderful purposes. Mm -hmm. And this is going to happen to this new kind of technology again. So again, there's a kind of continuity with what we've already had. We need to teach our students to be decent, rational citizens of our communities and to lead their lives in decent ways. Uh, is it going to work? Well, you know, looking at what's going on on the internet, sometimes, a few times, it's going to be great. A lot of the times, it's going to be horrible. And a lot of the time, it's going to be in between. Good. Okay. Thank you. I think that, um, again, this, uh, we, uh, this is something new. Okay. So we are still uh figuring this part out so i think that our universities have actually come up with policy guidelines on these issues and let's continue to monitor them and uh and 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 see um although i don't want to really uh put fears into people but i'd like to actually ask question number three because i think he's really a little bit edgy and i think that uh you know um uh this is actually projecting what's going to happen you know, uh, I, I know that we could have very good, nice scenarios in five years down, 10 years down, or oh, we all use this. It's almost like, a you know, um, a tools that we use right now, right? But do you imagine a worst case scenario of, okay, of using these generative AI tools in education? You know, uh, are we, um, can we just have a, a, a pocket, uh, intelligent tutor, for example, uh, our chatbot, that we don't even need to come to universities anymore. Uh, that may be the worst uh, case. And uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, maybe this I will mix up a little bit. Uh, Sean, would you like to go first? 
Yeah, I, I think the worst case scenario is uh, going with all the hype and forgetting about people, right? At the end of the day, it's people that matter within the educational yeah. setting. I mean, if we look at uh, Eric, the, the framework that you used and, and the other discussion, it, it when we think about redesigning assessments, we still need people, right? Uh, uh, Flora, in your examples that you have with interviewing for the journalism students, you still need people to go through that process and learn from mm -hmm. it, right? And we're just reminding ourselves that AI is a tool so I guess the worst case scenario is people forget that, uh, mm -hmm. that they've placed too much emphasis on the tool and they think it's, uh, you'll see people cutting out staff and, and so on. I don't think it will happen, but if you want a worst case scenario, that could be one. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, what about Herman? What do you think? I think the, the worst case scenario is one where a lot of young people abandon intellectual responsibility. They start using these you know, particular versions of these AI systems like a guru or a religion that just tells them the answer and has beautiful arguments for every position. I think giving up the kind of intellectual responsibility they should take on, that's one part. The second part I think would be really dreadful would be if it undermined the one important part of universities, which is having people sit together with other people yeah. and deliberate together and have social intelligent interactions, human to human. And if we think we don't need that because we have these AI systems, uh, that would be like a super major loss in quality of human life. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. Uh, Florin, what about you? Yeah, uh, to to just add to what uh, uh, has been said, I, I'm I'm scared, if you want, of a future where we lose that middle ground. I mean, we need to remember that uh, our uh, academias are places of debates where there is not one single answer that you know you can have many sides to uh, each and every uh, perspective and. I'm afraid that in the future, algorithms, AI uh, tools will uh, uh, go for simplifications, right? We'll go for the easy story for one-sided uh, approaches. And then in a fast-paced world, students, young people who come from uh, behind uh, will not pay enough attention to these kind of debates. They will not have the curiosity to look at uh, other perspectives. And yeah, probably that's where I am. Thank you. Yeah, Eric, what about you? Thank you. Now, to me, the worst case scenario, it's uh, not only the advancement and the proliferation of the tools, but, uh, you know, we all know that uh, tools can also spawn new tools. So, uh, you know, the worst case scenario is uh, the average person, our students, uh, can also, you know, to make use of the existing uh, libraries of tools to create new tools. And that would uh, absolutely, uh, you know, cannibalize the whole thing. So uh, I'm not sure whether this is a solution or not, but I, I have the feeling that uh, uh, staff uh, and colleagues need to uh, really catch up. In general, I believe for a student's ability to uh, master these tools and exploit these tools at the moment is far ahead of us. Uh, that's the one thing we need to catch up. And the second thing is uh, like the, all the other people have said, the very excitement of all the tools, uh, they, uh, you know, they get us excited because uh, they help us to interact with, uh, with computers, with robots, you know, in an exciting way, you know, taking us into a new dimension but very little about collaboration and, uh, you know, the collaboration among people, social uh, uh, relationships, social gatherings, and, uh, you know, the collaborations among peers. It's also very important to look at uh, collective wisdom, which uh, lead to a lot of innovation. So I would say that teachers would still have to uh, emphasize very much about the social and people-to-people -people aspect and design uh, more experiments and more uh, exercise for students to learn that way so that they appreciate it's more than just technologies and individuals interact interacting with technologies for the game. Mm, thank you. To just really quickly summarize, you know, the worst case scenario and how to combat that, right? I think that uh, uh, maybe it's the, the combating of the worst case scenario is really uh, emphasize on AI literacy, for example, on tools, social responsibility and ethics and assessment and so on and so forth. And also, Let's not forget, you know, we are human. We're not robots. We need interaction. We need collaboration. We need social, uh, you know, gatherings. And university and education really provides that context. So let's uh, let's let's not deviate uh, from that. And I think I'm going to just ask maybe one uh, last question. I don't know which one is it. Uh, 
Um, yeah. And this is also is something about the, the critical thinking, right? We we talk about the, the worst case scenario. It may be that, uh, do you think that we will lose our critical thinking abilities? And how can we actually um, maintain that? Uh, we I mentioned AI literacy. I mentioned social interaction. Are there any other ways so that we do not devaluate uh, our human element in education in the future? So for this one, I guess I will ask uh, Herman, you go first. <laughs> Any thoughts? I, I think I'll just sort of repeat what I was a sort of central thought in what I said at the beginning, which is mm -hmm. I think the way to, to combat that and to counteract it, in other words, in order to, to get the students to see the importance of their own ability to think critically, we just mm -hmm. highlight that these systems that they interact with don't agree on answers to very important questions. Almost all the questions that matter to us as human beings, they cannot answer. And it's our job to really, really highlight that as this, these systems cannot answer all those questions that I was mentioning in my, my presentation. Uh, because if you ask them, you'll get different answer from these machines and there will be an argument on this side and an argument on that side. And so where you're left as an individual, as a student, as a young person thinking about those questions is, Okay, here are five different views that people have come and there are good arguments on each side. Now it is my responsibility to endorse one position over the other. And if we can get them to see the importance of that, that so at least the first step in the direction of uh, getting them to recognize the importance of their own rationality and thinking. Okay, maybe I'll just ask what the other would like to, because I think maybe the next question is even more interesting about the future. So is there anyone else who would like to add to what Herman just said? I'll just quickly add, instead of just uh, right now, both of us are measuring students based on the final deliverable, like the example that I gave, uh, we also measure on the process, especially on the, the process in planning to achieve the deliverable. And, stu and teachers can give uh, interactive uh, feedback uh, once, multiple times, so that uh, the teacher can gain about uh, whether the students actually uh, you know, mastering critical thinking skills, applying critical thinking skills, if not help them, guide them to improve during that process. Yes, yes, I also agree. How about we do this? I'm gonna just ask, uh, let's go to question number five, because this is about the uh, future, future research and development, okay? In your expertise, you know, from your expertise perspective, what would you think some of the future research and development that uh, you see, Okay, in terms of uh, generative AI tools and uh, for education. Okay, so who has not started? I mean, Florin, maybe you could start. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, probably uh, we are entering a, a stage where these uh, uh, device, the, the, these tools will become uh, uh, will will uh, appear faster and faster, right? It will be more difficult for us to uh, uh, catch up with them, uh, although they are faster they are not necessarily more reliable, right? So I will pay attention to this part. How do we ensure, also answering the previous question, how do we ensure that we have a reality check on what these mm. uh, AI developments are uh, are doing? Uh, that's why I think using AI in, in um, uh, authentic assessments where we have a real place, real people, real things, that will give us this kind of reality check. Otherwise, speculating on the future, find it very difficult. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sean, would you like to respond? Your yeah, thoughts on future. Uh, yeah. I'm going to pick up on that word speculation because that's a lot of, that's what's happening a lot right now. A lot of people are speculating on the impact of GPT and, mm -hmm. and education. Uh, so my, my suggestion is for the future research and development is actually look a bit to the past, right? Look at our research on uh, problem-based teaching and learning. Look at our research uh, design-based teaching and learning or other uh, areas that we've already are well established in educational sciences and learning sciences. And then take that and see how JetGPT changes the game. Does it enhance uh, problem-based teaching and learning if it's put designed into a learning task? 
right? Um, can we apply ChatGPT into design thinking based approach to an assessment where students have yeah. to go through a design thinking process? And how does GPT role fall into that? And does it enhance the learning outcomes? So my argument is instead of speculating about things that, because we don't know what we don't know, right? Uh, let's go back to the past a little bit. We do know certain things and how learning occurs. We know uh, our learning sciences. And then how does ChatGPT impact that and does it have any impact yeah good good thank you well uh eric uh yes i believe that uh you know we need to better understand uh these tools as i said at the beginning of my uh, talk yep. and uh, we integrate as teachers we integrate various types of tools based on the strength and appropriateness mm. into the teaching and learning process and as what uh, sean said with that, we should be able to look for areas where we can accelerate and broaden the exposure of teacher and students at different part of the learning process. And that's what these two will be uh, best in uh, helping us uh, to drive faster into a better future. Fantastic. Herman, would you like to I think, uh, close? I do, I do have something that I'm very excited about that doesn't exist yet, but I can see it happening. Because I think the hardest part when you're like us and you're talking to 40, 50, 100 people at a time in a lecture is the, the prospect of something that can individually address issues that students don't know how to handle, that we don't know them well enough. So if they, you know, 10 years from now, there's a chatbot, you, the, a particular student with a particular problem goes in and it understands exactly how to address the worry given that student's history and whatever, you know, I don't know how to know about that, but that's sort of like individualized, customized mm -hmm. insight into problem solving and advancement of understanding. That would be yeah. an incredible tool. Can I, can I just follow up on what you're saying there, Hermic? I agree with you. I mean, just think about what might be coming out with Copilot. One mm -hmm. of the key features that I'm excited about is Teams in the video conferencing uh, application where it will generate meeting notes and, and uh, categorize them for you immediately. But what they're also promising, whether or not it can really do it, is if I come to late to a meeting, for example, I can ask Teams what was discussed before I arrived and it will summarize what was discussed before I arrived. Now think of the teaching and learning implications of a tool like that, if it's possible. You have a lecture of, as you said, 300 students. A student doesn't understand what you just talked about for the last half hour. Mm -hmm. They can write in teams. Can you summarize what he said? Explain it to me in a different way. And then that student has immediate access, immediate mm -hmm. to what the professor was just saying, right? Yeah. Uh, to me, that has a lot of promise for teaching and learning. Yep. And uh, I also like to share Stanford's uh, Alpaca is uh, basically a desktop uh, uh, GPT. Uh, so you could pre-train with your actually little world so that hopefully we could have personalized uh, pre-training models. Well, you know, small language model, I call it. Not large, but small. Uh, so that you could be personalized in the future. So we are walking toward that direction, Herman. And I would just say that this is a fantastic. We, ha we have proliferation of tools, like AI tools, coming out every single week now uh, for various uh, uh, th uh, things, like Eric mentioned, you know, audio, text, video, 3D sketching, and code coding, and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm looking forward to a very exciting era. And uh, I'm gonna just leave a few more minutes, okay, for the audience to ask our panelists some questions. And panelists, if you can answer in the Q and A, please go ahead. But I'm gonna leave now to open up the, the floor. Audience, do we have any questions for our panelists? Um, maybe I will. Um, so, so finally. finally of King is uh, ChatGPT in the audience. Maybe I will take charge of this part. So, uh, okay. Professor, okay. Can, you, can you mute first? Finally, finally, we come to the Q&A session. If you have any questions for our esteemed panelists, please feel free to share them in the comment box. We have received several thought-provoking questions already, 
I, I will wait them aloud for the panelists to provide their valuable insights. So let's begin with the first question. Um, the audience is asking Professor Kaplan, why is Professor Kaplan so certain that AIs won't develop to the point at which they are capable of assessing thoughts and genuine collaborative thinking as a full-fledged member of various collaboratives? What is the missing ingredient in their design that makes them allegedly incapable forever of this? I, I don't think they're incapable of assessing different sides of a question. But if you take a complicated question like which religion is correct or what's the job that will make me the happiest or should I be a vegetarian? What it can do, I think beautifully already is describe arguments for and against on each side. But where does that leave you? You now have to assess the arguments on each side and you have to take a stand. So that is no matter how good the AI system is at assessing and presenting each case, there isn't a unique answer because which answer is correct depends on your personal low values, your way of life, your background. And so now you have to assess the, the system can present the arguments for you. Now your thinking has to kick in. And so, so that's the, so it's not that it cannot present, it can't make the decision for you. In order for you, you can be, you can now be presented with this beautiful structure of different arguments for different views, different religions, different ways of life. But that just makes it even more crucial for you as an individual to think through those positions and take your own stand. That, that was the thought. So thank you, Professor Captain. We have also received another qu interesting question from our audience, uh, which is asking, um, Professor Choi, Professor Choi's idea for alternative essay assessment sounds quite rough and could be very good for the students, but it also would be much, much more time consuming for teachers. How can we balance improving assessment, improving assessment and keeping tasks for staff to a manageable level? Professor Choi, please. Yeah. Thank you. So what I propose is uh, very initial, and uh, I only plan to, uh, you know, to try it on a small scale in small classes. You are right. You know, that's one of my worries as well. So until, uh, you know, to, we are, you know, to, we are better resourced, or we are equipped with some, uh, you know, authentic uh, tools to counteract uh, and check for us. Otherwise, uh, at the moment, uh, it uh, it just cannot be scaled up to large classes. Uh, if we expand one deliverables into four deliverables, you're right. Thank you. So we have got another thought provoking question from our panelists. Um, why do you think people like Yuval Hawa and Elon Musk have signed this open letter, Future of Life Institute Open Letter post giant AI experiments? Would you sign it? So maybe, um, Sean, do you have any ideas on it? Well, I can't. I can't speak for the authors of the letter on why they wrote it, but I, I suspect it's because uh, it touches on a little bit what I was talking about. Things are moving fast. The commercial companies are the driving factor behind the development of these tools, and there really is no common policy or gatekeeper that can capture all cultures, all societies, all needs. Right, and uh, as technology moves so fast. People are um, chasing, the companies are chasing for the next in, uh, in, in, in the market. And uh, that runs the danger of ignoring ethical implications and responsible use. And that ignores people being thorough in looking at how they're training the, uh, the algorithms to, to read the data sets and so on. I just read an article today that uh, Microsoft, Meta, and Google they have laid off their AI ethics departments, uh, or they they decreased uh, those departments. Now, of course, whether or not that means they'll be less effective, I don't know. 
but they are decreasing those areas. So I think that's the reason behind the pause. They're not saying stop, right? We can't stop this, but we might need to pause. Whether that's a possible thing to do, I don't know. I, it's, it's, I, I suspect it'd be very hard to pause. Um, although I do agree with the intention uh, a little bit. Um, do other speakers and has other ideas on this question? I mean, just briefly, I, I don't have anything original and nothing about what they were thinking, but I think the underlying worry about many of those who are skeptical is that it develops so fast that it can be dangerous. And so the danger, as I'm sure many of you know, is just when you get AIs that can generate even more powerful AIs that can generate even more powerful AIs, it can end up doing things that at the end of the day might threaten even the existence of human beings on earth. We just don't know. And if it goes incredibly fast, we need to pause, make sure nothing like that happens. I mean, in this current form, there are misrepresented and underrepresented or uh, cultures and subcultures in the data sets, right? Just look at Midjourney and what it pumps out for pictures. Uh, you can see a clear bias in a lot of the images. All robots look almost the same when you ask it to do a generative image of a robot, right? Uh, so that's partially a reason I think that we need to slow down and rethink things. Oh, yes. Um, so um, moving on to the last question, um, which is how can we use chat GPT for social sciences related subjects like comparative government and histories? So do our panelists have any idea on um, this question? Yeah. I've been toying with different methods uh, for, for tasks in the classroom. Uh, and, and you can use ChatGPT to identify gaps in literature or content. You can use it to create things. You can use it to uh, build a prototype to solve a problem. You can use it as a companion to help uh, um, uh, design something or maybe create something. The point is, in social sciences, I think you can present a, a problem and have students interact with ChatGPT with different prompts, get multiple answers, and then in groups discuss the answers and then identify are these answers feasible, which one's more feasible, which one isn't. So anything that requires social interaction or has uh, well, in social sciences, I think, yes, short answers, yes, I think it's very useful if you take these kind of approaches. Yes, so how about other panelists? So maybe- Yeah, if yeah Terrence, I just, I just want to say, I think uh, for any subject, uh, we need to be a better prompt engineer. So we need to learn how to prompt, right? Summarize, create, list, and all these are the keywords that we could actually do for any subject, not only for history and and uh, uh, policy and so on and so forth. So uh, we just need to learn the tools and how to do that. And in fact, I just want to say that we will have future seminars uh, that will be hands-on more on these type of uh knowledge for the teachers and the learners um, to, to know more about these generative AI tools. Thank you. Parents? Yes. Um, so one of our audience has asked that, um, would you agree that generative AI can be used by teachers for assessing students' work? Do our speakers um, have any thoughts of it? Yeah. yeah I, I, think, I think to some extent you will be able to do that in the future, especially can we imagine a future where all the universities in Hong Kong will have their own uh, uh, AI uh, system and, uh, you know, we can train these systems and we can tell them exactly what are the expectations and what constitutes a good uh, paper and uh, a poor one. Probably in the future we will be able to do that even more. But we are taking away the human element, right? When uh, when this happens, so uh, technically, I think we can do it, but practically, I don't see uh, uh, a lot of benefits for switching to such uh, such a model.
So we've, we will move on to the um, next session. Um, so thank you for attending this webinar. We are thrilled to have such an enthusiastic audience. So before you go, um, we kindly ask that you take a few moments to complete our post event questionnaire. Your feedback is incredibly valuable to us and it will help us improve our future events. And you can access the questionnaire by scanning the QR code on the slide or clicking the link in the chat box. To stay informed of the latest information about KIP, make sure to follow our LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, all the panelists and the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Prop King. Thank you, Eric. Have lunch now. Go. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.